So the, the price of the prior property, I'll call it property A, that required a lot of renovation, uh, it, it was considerably less, maybe half or a third of, of, this, of the high tour property. But it was, uh, it was um, seen by a lot of our folks as so much riskier that they had no appetite for it. This, the second property, because it was already renovated, had a history of uh, rentals for overnight stays and weddings. It's got an event barn with bathrooms and lights. It's got accommodations for 20 people. It has the right zoning. It's got everything ready to go. It doesn't matter to, uh, it doesn't seem to matter to people that would be lending money for that property that it costs a little more. Um, because th there's not as much concern with risk, with the headaches, with permitting, with all the things that can go wrong, um, especially when they know that other people are coming in, um, you know, for, for the capital raise. I just hadn't, I hadn't realized the extent of, you know, price is one of many factors. Welcome to the Feast Over Famine podcast. On this podcast, we're navigating the tension that we find where mission and profit collide. We're talking to CEOs, founders, executive directors, impact investors, and all of what we've identified as the global ecosystem of the social enterprise, business for transformation, business as mission landscape. We're talking to them about the obstacles they face, the strategic challenges they've been through, how they're funded, how they were started, and everything that's happened in between. We are trying to share their story in a way that's impactful to help us all to grow the social enterprise space for the better. Enjoy this week's episode with your host, Ryan Mahaffey. All right, everyone, welcome to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. Really stoked you all are here listening. And man, I'm so excited for this week's episode. Uh, we have Scott Mucko on the call with us of Ivandale Retreats, but also the High Tour Project in DC. Scott, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Ryan. So excited to be here. Yeah, man. So we've, I was just saying, like, I was saying we've developed quite the relationship over the past six nine months or so i guess i mean i think it's only been six months and i was like you know what really it's like a friendship so I, yeah i'm just thankful to be hanging out with a brother and uh and having Absolutely. fun and, and talking about what you're doing because i i love it i'm excited about it and it's cool i mean the lord's hand is like super super in it uh and that's obvious so so yeah i'm i'm, I'm excited to, to unpack this a little more yeah absolutely cool uh why don't why don't we start here Give me a little bit of your backstory. Um, and, and so just so people know, like what we're talking about is essentially a, a historic property outside of DC that you guys are purchasing. Um, you're gonna be running corporate events, weddings, Airbnb, all that kind of stuff, uh, a large percentage of the time and then and kind of doing a pastor's retreat model. And we're gonna unpack that. I'm not doing it justice. So as people yeah. have like a framework of what you're doing, that's kind of it. But let's start sure. with a little bit of your backstory um, and then maybe transition into like, how this even became a thing that you cared about and, uh, and wanted to get involved in. Yeah, Ryan, I appreciate it. Well, this, you know, my backstory and this project really started with a phone call and, um, I was serving as an elder at our church in Virginia and I got a phone call from the senior pastor and he told me he would need to step down due to some problems that, that he was having. And it was, uh, it came as a total surprise. And uh, we were a pretty small church. There were only three elders and the senior pastor was one of them. And at the time I was serving as a real estate developer and uh, I'm um, renovating historic properties. And that was my full-time job, but serving as uh, one, of the lay pa one of the lay elders in the church. So pretty quickly, the other elder and I had to communicate to the church that um, that pastor would be stepping down and we had an opportunity to see a little bit behind the scenes, the, the life of the pastor, um, the loneliness and the exhaustion mm. um, and the work um, that these folks do. Most of them are working 55 to 75 hours a week and really don't have anybody to talk to. So, and that's probably, that's probably just that 55 to 75 hours a week. That's probably just like active working time. That's not like, 
the weight on right. the brain side of things that you're just like sitting there at night watching TV or something and right. it, it just weighed on you and you're thinking about it. I mean, so it's a little different than a job where it's, you know, you're there grinding, but you don't have to take it home. And even a job that you take home, I mean, it's, it's a weighty, uh, emotional kind of, kind of role. It, it totally, it totally is. It totally yeah. is. And there's hospital visits and there's funerals mm, and, yeah. um, there's, there's the upside there's baptisms and weddings, but there's a lot of, and, and I think the other thing that, um, that I began to realize is there's, you know, for a lot of pastors, there's nobody to talk to. Um, mm. I read, I read somewhere in, in kind of studying for this project, 58% of pastors don't have a single person they consider a close friend. And so, um, there is a real loneliness that goes along with it. Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? And like researching that, I mean, it's not because they're introverted, non-social skills people, right? Right. They're like totally, not even that someone that is that way, like can't have friends, but there's they're someone who yeah. theoretically could make friends and make them easily and maintain relationships. Like what in all that research and kind of your thinking through it leads to that, do you think? Yeah, man, I, I've, you know, I've talked to a couple, um, a couple friends of mine who are in full-time ministry as, as pastors. I think that part of it might be that, that they see their role as, um, you know, a leader and a counselor to so many that there is, um, you know, the impression that they have to maintain a certain, um, a certain st uh, stature of, um, of the leader that, um, showing, you know, too much weakness is difficult. So they're constantly yeah. counseling other people. Um, so I, I think it makes it a, a somewhat difficult, um, difficult, lonely position to share their, their own weaknesses. Yeah. So, um, yeah. theologically, I mean, I, this is going off the deep end and you, I, I yeah. didn't go to seminary. So I <laughs> like, I don't know how much we can fully speak to this, but I think we kind of can like how much, like, is that theologically accurate? Like that a pastor has to be that in order to lead as a pastor, I mean, obviously you're counseling in that you have to uphold a, uh, like a stature and all that kind of stuff to some degree, but is that, is that how it was supposed to be designed? I guess is my question, you know? Um, is that how God designed and wanted for like pastoral leadership to be is that it is kind of a different relationship to everybody else, or is it meant to be one of the body and one of the community and one of the family? And I don't know if you'll ever get away from it, but have we, have we yeah. moved it too far the other way? Yeah. That's, that's a great, it's a great question. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I think, man, I, something, something needs to be done certainly, mm. which is yeah really the heart behind this project. Yeah. Um, what we're seeing, I think right now is, is not, is, is not working properly. Um, there's, there's just a lot of, I mean, just some recent, I, I think with COVID, what we're seeing has been exacerbated. I mean, yeah, a recent statistic showed that 38% of pastors, this is from Barna Research, 38% of pastors in the past two years have considered quitting the ministry and dropping out. It's crazy. Um, and under 40, if they're under 40 years old, it that figure reaches nearly 50%. Yeah. So, um, so that's, I, I think that comes, comes a little bit to what we're trying to do with this project. Um, if, if it's not too early to yeah, get yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah. Um, dive in. So like, so that's yeah. part of the challenge of starting. I mean, I think even our lack of ability to put it to words and solution, like calls yeah. for how much of a need there is. Right. It's almost, it's just like really tough, heavy thing. That's like, man, what do we do about this? Right. And so, all right. So you get this call, you find out out about your, your lead pastor, you're an elder, you guys are trying to figure that out. You're like, that's weighing on you heavily. So, so where does that go from there? Like, how do you merge those two things? The Lord just laid on my heart, a love for these pastors and their families. Right. So mm -hmm. it's not just the senior pastor, but um, it's their family, it's their children, their spouse. Right. And um, and that's kind of part, you know, one on one hand. And then the other hand is, um, just a, 
just a kind of a background in renovating mm-hmm. historic properties. And I began praying, Lord, how can these two come together? And is there, is there a way to give these pastors rest at a property? And the other the other piece here is that a lot of these pastors um, don't have the budget either in their um, in their own personal budget or uh, the church doesn't have yeah. funds to provide yeah. rest. And so I was sitting at a Panera um, drinking coffee and I was praying, Lord, I don't want to I, I don't have any idea what the next steps are, but I just want to hear from you. Like, how how can we how can this be done and give, you know, just bless the church? And as I was praying, what really landed on my heart was these pastors and their families need to be able to stay for free. Hmm. And it was just crystal clear. This was early last year. And as I began began thinking about the word free, then I started thinking, well, how, how is it, how could they possibly stay free at a property? And then that, that really started me down the path of, well, you'd have to generate revenues from the property. So we've looked at and finally found a really great property where you generate revenues from hosting weddings, overnight stays like Airbnb and VRBO, and then corporate retreats. Yeah. Sufficient revenues so that pastors and their families can stay for free 20% mm. of the year or a double tithe. Yeah. Awesome. Which which is kind of where you landed and we're going to break it down a little deeper, but Talk to me, I guess we're always challenging people to say like, Hey, like how in your career and where you're at today, can you get involved in this social enterprise kind of thing, right? Business for transformation, like using your work and what you're doing in a really unique way. Is that something that you thought about? I mean, obviously it, you know, like historic property, like that, that's kind of your world. And then it's merging with this ministry opportunity. Had you been thinking or what, what was your faith and work journey like around, Hey, how do I integrate my skill set, what I'm doing and all that into this? Or did it just kind of like pop in one day? Like how, how has that journey been? Yeah, I was, um, I was trying to figure out a way with these two to merge them together it, it hit me that if I was going to spend a lot of time doing the real estate and as a believer that I might as well try to bring the two together. Mm-hmm. Um, you spend so many hours working that as a believer, I might as well bring my faith into my work yeah. and, and merge and merge the two and, and different, um, you know, different career paths have, you know, have a different look to them but this was a new enterprise. And so mm. it had the ability to really take on the shape of a direct, um, a direct impact for the pastors. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, and I just, I mean, sometimes it just hits people upside the head and they're like, Oh, here's an opportunity. I'm just going to run with it. Yeah. And it's like, you're kind of just prepared to do that. Other people, it's a long, long process of exploring and thinking about what that's going to be. And then finally pulling the trigger. So it's, it's just cool to hear that piece of the story for, for people. Um, okay, cool. So, so let's move to kind of the model then. So you've got and I'm going to throw some terms at Ivendale retreats. You've got uh Libre, is it Libre retreats? Right. Um, right. and you've got high tour, which is the property. So I guess just kind of, and, and all the reason that's important is it's like how you figured out the way to lay out this model in an effective way with the profits and everything. So let's just start there before we break down, like, the actual revenue streams and some of those things, but how did you set this up and how did the different couple entities work together um, for you to do that? Sure. So there is, I'll I'll start with the kind of the for-profit side. So there's Ivendale LLC and that entity will own the high tour property. So high tour is the name of a, an historic farm we have under contract to purchase which is so, beautiful, like beautiful, like massive swimming pool, like cool rock outcroppings. I mean, it's awesome. Right. I mean, I've only seen the pictures, but every time you go, you're super jazzed the next time we talk. <laughs> so you were, yeah. It's so, it's so amazing. Right. Yeah. It's a really cool, it's a really cool property. It's been protected. It's gorgeous. It's um, 178 acres of mountains and fields and trails and Cool. Uh, ponds. Yeah. It's really so cool. pretty. 
So, cool. so you'll have to come, you have to come out. Yeah, soon. yeah. Okay. So Ivandale LLC, the for profit is what is purchasing that property then. That's right. That's right. And then 20% of the time pastors and their families can stay for free. So, you know, working with our attorneys, figuring out how that, um, how that gets worked out. There is a separate entity, Libre Retreats, that's a nonprofit, and that's not directly related. That's that's separate. Yep. Um, but but that's also been established. And one of the one of the visions, Ryan, and we've talked a little bit about this, but that that this idea and the blessing of pastors um, to give them rest would one day extend beyond kind of the Washington D.C. area, beyond mm-hmm. Virginia, but but ultimately to the nations. Um, yeah. So that, um, you know, in support of the Great Commission, so, you know, pastors and their families worldwide could receive rest. Yeah. And so Libre might play a role in that. Ivandale, like you, you've kind of set up the entity structure that you can do the for profit activity. Uh, if you want, you can donate into the nonprofit and then gift to like some of the pastors' travel expenses or something. I mean, you guys are still in the phase of like figuring out exactly how that flow will work, which I think is one of the easy parts overall. Um, I think that'll come out as it's, as it's executed, but you have the right entities and it gives you room to scale. And, and so scaling then, uh, like you said, you want to bring this Nate, like, what does that look like? Cause we, I, I know there's a slide in your pitch deck that we built and stuff. Like what, what's your vision and uh, timeline and what this would look like to not just be about the Virginia area. So we anticipate um, purchasing and closing on the high tour property in the next few months. And then, uh, Lord willing, moving, moving beyond that property and continuing to scale up future properties mm. uh, over the next, um, you know, several years and decades until we, until we're able to move, um, you know, out to the, out to the nations, out to the seven continents. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. I, I mean, I can't wait. And in a pretty quick timeline, like, as you looked at the financial projections and stuff, this, this is a model that, that basically at, at a big macro level, it, one property is become self-sustaining while giving away 20% of its available occupancy to pastors and their families. And then you're basically taking the profits out of that, stacking them up, paying yourself a salary and making sure you can provide for your family, which I think is, right. is really important. Right. Um, and, and serving you as an entrepreneur, but then taking those, reinvesting them in a future property. So anyone who is part of this initial capital raise, they're like, they're not just getting this one kind of property. They're getting that ongoing piece. And there's no stopping of that. Cause you know, it, it, it scales really well, right? You have two of them. Now you can start the third one that much faster. Cause you got two rounds of profit going in right. and then four and five, and it just grows and scales. So I think it's one of the things we're always challenging projects to do and entrepreneurs do is like, think about, your strategic roadmap, like where do you want to be in, in five, 10 years? It doesn't have to be picture perfect, but if you can start with that and reverse engineer a little bit, you can start to put some of the pieces together on the front end that saves you work later and saves you expense later and just kind of sets up that trajectory. And I think that's something you guys have done really well is you know what needs to happen right now today as an entrepreneur, but you also know where you're headed and you've merged those things well. And, and it even, it just comes out really clear and concise. And I think that's one of the reasons like we'll talk about your capital raise. One of the reasons you guys got funded so quickly is because those pieces are there and there's like a confidence that goes with it, which is pretty cool. So, um, I, and I love that macro level vision and, and what's happening with it. it. It's super cool. So talk to me about the business model. Um, you kind of, we've kind of glossed over it, but let's go a little deeper on weddings, Airbnb. I mean, Airbnb is a, everyone's wanting to buy a investment property and Airbnb it out and have it for themselves. And there's all sorts of challenges, weddings, man, like post COVID weddings and all sorts of stuff going on with that yeah. and corporate yeah. retreats. And I, I think when I hear corporate retreats, I always just think like, and large sales cycle of just finding like doing that. And so just talk to me about the business model and what's going into that and what, what, what that's going to sure. look like. Sure. Well, one, one thing we, one thing we found, so just to, just to reiterate, we have three key business uh, revenue streams. And um, so the, the first one is weddings. The second one is 
uh, overnight stays, and the third is corporate retreats. And in each one of these, well, I'll say the fourth is the free side of it, which is ministry and the ministry piece and pastors. So in each one of these key areas, we've built a partnership. And that's that's frankly been, and you've been a really key in, in helping us think through that. But in each one of those areas, we've built a really good partnership that's really helped a lot, um, or, or we have a, a really good team member. So um, we start with the beginning of the year and we look at 365 days out of the year. And our, our heart and the mission is really to bless pastors in the 20% of free days. But in order to do that, we have to generate sufficient revenues or otherwise, you know, nothing can be, you know, the project doesn't move forward. The, the highest revenues are the weddings. And in, in Loudoun County, Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC, the weddings go for weekend rental between 20 and 25,000 for a weekend rental. And so we focus on booking our wedding weekends for the spring and fall season first. And then we schedule all of our blackout dates for our Airbnb rentals. And then we have a key partner that's uh, setting up our corporate retreats that are usually midweek. And then we we have a key ministry partner, um, uh, One Heart DC, that represents over 700 churches. And that works well also because pastors are typically available Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, which are um, not as um, high use for, you know, folks looking to get away for the weekend and they're willing to come in on those, uh, you know, non high use days. So, um, that's a little bit about how we yeah. know, use our, and I remember our, looking our, at the our weeks and time calendar of capacity for the year and be like, okay, this is wedding season. This is kind of end of year retreats. This is kind of when corporates will go, this is in like laying it out. And be, I think we, we were toying with the 80, 20 number at one point. And, yeah. uh, and we kind of laid it out and I think it, I think it actually just like shook out that way, or it was like, I don't know, 78% and 22 or so, something like that. Oh, all right. All right this works. Yeah. <laughs> Let's run yeah. with it. So it's kind of cool. That, 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 perfect. that piece uh, fell together well for you guys, um, which is awesome. So uh, give me an idea of like, to the degree you're comfortable, like just top line numbers, like what, what kind of revenue does a facility like this theoretically at, at full capacity kind of running kind of produce in a year? And I think it's cool to share this number. I, I don't know if you have it, but like we could just use round numbers. Like how much are you guys giving up while still being profitable? Right. So it's like, well, a facility like this makes $2 million a year. Uh, and or we'll just use round number. I mean, that is round number. We'll use more round numbers because it's Monday and I'm tired and I don't want to do math a million dollars a year. <laughs> so we could make $800,000. We can make a million dollars a year at X, you know, let's just say a 50% gross margin or something. And so we got 500 K left over, or we can make 800 K and have 400 K left over. So we're basically leaving a hundred thousand dollars on the table but it's worth it from a ministry standpoint. So I love models like that because I think it just shows that you can, you can use the global economic marketplace for social good and still be successful and, and fiscally self-sustaining. So talk just, and you don't, your numbers don't have to be perfect. You can use round numbers like I did, but talk a little bit about how that financial model works for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So we anticipate, so in year one, we'll purchase the property in, uh, we'll close in, in May of, of this year. Um, we anticipate we, we won't be able to catch the spring wedding market, which is the big wedding market. We'll be able to catch just a little bit of the uh, fall wedding market. Uh, so the revenues in the first year will be under a million. However, by um, by 2023, 24, we'll have we'll have revenues of a million and a half ish around there by, by 2026, um, you know, 1.7, 1.8 million, something like that. Yeah. Um, but we'll be giving up 20% of yeah. capacity to pastors and their families. So, um, I think it's fair to say we're giving up, um, three, $400,000. Yeah. Which is so uh, cool. I mean, I just, annually. it's such a unique way of thinking about business to just, you know, it's not, it's not even real cash in a sense, you, like for you guys, it's like, you're just giving up the opportunity of revenues and making it work. Uh, other business models, they actually have to produce the product and give it away or something and it works, but man, it's just such an encouraging thing to see and to see it work 
perfectly the way you guys want to is, um, is awesome. So how many, uh, and, and I remember you seeing some charts, you can use your numbers, like what, what does that 20% represent number of pastors or their families per year kind of coming through the doors, uh, like, you know, of one of these properties. Right. So 20% works out to 75 days a year. So initially, initially my thought was that would be 75, um, excuse me, 75 nights. And I was thinking, you know, each pastor could be three days, maybe have 20 pastors, which I, I thought was, was great. When we started a conversation with Howie Levin, the executive director yep. of One Heart DC, uh, he, he kind of, he kind of blew me away with, uh, with what their needs were and then what our partnership has become. So their pastors in their network, um, have found that what they really need is to come together in what they call leadership cluster retreats. Mm. So for these little three day getaways, instead of having one pastor, they want to bring 10 pastors at a time. Wow. And they want to have one every month. So over the course of a year, they'll bring in 120 pastors hmm. as opposed to 20. And um, so each one of these, um, each one of these cluster retreats benefits, you know, these folks greatly and multiplies what we were able to do. Yeah. Which is, I mean, to go back to that whole like loneliness and friendship thing. I mean, pastors can go to retreats or conferences or different kinds of things and build relationships. I'm not saying that's like a silver bullet to the issue of having friendships, but if it's localized and they can build friendship relationships in that format, that kind of solves that other issue too. So I think the partnership with, and you guys are going to learn a lot. I mean, you guys in the first year are going to say, wow, this worked, this didn't work, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's super, super cool to see that. And think about the exponential impact. So we think we're, we're impacting, you know, that many pastors lives, but that's that many churches, right. And those churches represent anywhere from 50 to 5,000 or more people. And now it, a healthy pastor leading people. Well, those people are going to go have an impact on the world in a bigger, better way as a result of that. And, um, and so the, it's almost impossible to look at the trickle down effect of what's going to happen from that, which I think is, is a pretty, you know, when you can get that many degrees of separation of impact and kind of see that working, it, it's, it's a win, win all around and, and super cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for your, you, you've been great in helping us think through this and, and how to, how to multiply. I, I think one of the things that we've seen that, that I hadn't seen, frankly, coming in this was the, the, value of the different partnerships and how one plus one, you're not just bringing in a partner at any different level. That's, that's um, overseeing a certain area. They're coming in with not only, not only expertise, but they're coming Mm -hmm. in and they're, they're, they're bringing in so much that can multiply within that field and bringing in more ideas, more people and things just begin to like turnover and accelerate yeah. and grow. Uh, it's just, I mean, it, it gets, it gets so much more exciting. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is exciting. It's super fun. All right, everyone. I want to take a quick break from today's episode and just share a little bit about impact foundation. Who's got an incredibly awesome model of using impact investment, charitable dollars, and funding tons of projects all over the world right now. What if your investments could change the world? At Impact Foundation, they believe business with purpose has the power to transform society. Purpose built for impact investing, Impact Foundation provides a streamlined way to fund businesses that seek social and spiritual transformation or make loans to charity, all while earning a financial return to grow your giving. Donors and investors have already supported more than 200 redemptive enterprises through their impact accounts. They provide needed fuel for companies that exist as a force of God's redemptive work in the world. To learn more about what they're doing and their kingdom impact investing model, visit impactfoundation.org. So let's talk a little bit about the capital raise. Like, so that's, I mean, one, just say, I mean, I love the model. I love what you guys are doing. It's awesome. I can't wait to see it flourish. And then not just flourish in, in Loudoun County there, but like at high tour, but even to other parts of the country and other parts of the world. It's, it's just awesome. And I can't wait to see in five, 10 years what happens with it. So 
Um, but you, you guys had to raise a significant amount of capital. And obviously we talk about social enterprise and all that on this podcast. We're also really passionate about impact investing and, um, 75% of the projects we work on end up needing capital. And I think that's representative of the space. Like you can't just go do this stuff. You need capital. And so let's, and, and uh, your, your close, your raise is closed. You know, that was one of the reasons we started working together was, um, some obstacles and challenges there. Um, and, and, and honestly, I, I share your story as a success story all the time without all the details of just like, wow, like, you know, uh, one, I think the Lord's hand is on it for those reasons, but I think you put the right effort in with the right attitude and all that kind of stuff to make it happen. So let's, yeah. Talk about the capital raise, I guess, share with, share with me. Here's the things maybe like, how much did you guys raise? And what was the format of that to the degree you're comfortable and you can use round numbers or just shy of this or something like that. Um, and then where kind of the first stage of that was, because I think you kind of had a first stage of that and you had some obstacles and challenges. What some of the shifts, and I know we work together, but I, like what were some of the core shifts in your mind that happened? And then how long did it take to close and where you're at now? I think kind of going through that would be really helpful and encouraging to a lot of people raising capital out there to kind of hear from that. Yeah. So let me, let me begin by saying that the first time we had a different property, and I, I, I failed miserably at raising anything. <laughs> and there is a season and there is a time it seems that the Lord is in something. And there's a time it seems when the Lord is not in something. Hmm. And uh, I, I, I don't know that I understood that fully before. Hmm. I, I get the sense that um, there's nothing that has changed. I I've worked just as hard. I worked just as hard before as I did now. Um, and, um, I prayed just as much before as I did now. And I've heard, I've heard now that people said, I think the Lord is in this. And I don't think he was really in that project, mm -hmm. this other property we're looking at before. And yeah. so I guess the, the first thing that I have to say is like there, it, there is truly like uh, a waiting on the Lord. Um, I think, that's I think that, that is, I, I can't say that anymore clearly. Like there was, it was like getting blood from a turnip. Like it just wasn't happening. There yeah. was nothing I could have done more because I was working yeah. so hard. Yeah, you were. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's just the key lesson for any entrepreneur, you know, um, in general, like, I mean, it just, there's gotta be some wisdom and discernment around like, what, what's really going on? Is this, is this working? Is it not working? you know, and an ability. Yeah. Anyways, I think that's a, uh, innate lesson that you kind of learn with experience, but is, is needed to be successful in, in any sort of business or organization or project and getting it going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, um, just briefly, the, the, the previous project needed a lot of renovation and I had a 50 page business plan, all the details. And I kept, hearing from uh, folks that we went to to talk to them and that it just wasn't receiving any traction, which is when you and I connected. And uh, we found this high tour project, which was significantly more expensive. And uh, people seemed to like it because it was ready to go and would, wouldn't have uh, renovation. It wouldn't have anything else. We could begin renting it and have revenues immediately. And this is when you and I connected about moving from the business plan to the pitch deck. And um, so when we released the pictures of the swimming pool and the houses and the, the revenue stream and the partnerships, et cetera, um, it seemed the Lord was in it. And yeah. the capital raise really began to come together, perhaps once people saw the momentum and the, you know, the possibilities. So. So Scott, I remember there being kind of like a couple challenges. One was the risk associated with, and you, you kind of mentioned this, the risk associated with the, uh, the remodeling and all stuff that had to be done. I think that's an important lesson can be taken away from that yeah. as far as raising capital goes. And the right. other one is, um, so like equity versus debt versus like what type of investor are you approaching that kind of thing. Um, right. and so just talking to the, uh, the remodel and the renovations and all those kinds of things, like as you're, the more you have to do, the more can go wrong, the more revenues can be prolonged, the more money can be need to be raised. And now you start stacking up the risk for the investor to say, wow, this is a challenge. So it's interesting sometimes raising $500,000 more of capital, for example, could actually 
lend to you being more successful than trying to only raise 400 and get, you know, 400,000 instead of 900 or something like that. And, you know, you could raise double the amount, get that money quicker because there's less risk associated. I think that was a lesson. That was something you were kind of toying with and going to this new property, as you were saying, like really helped that. And, and so I think it's a cool lesson there for other people, maybe raising capital in the future. Absolutely. And I, I had not taken that into consideration, but the, so the, the price of the prior property, I'll call it property A, that required a lot of renovation, uh, it, it was considerably less, maybe half or a third of, of, this, mm. of the high tour property. But it was, uh, it was um, seen by a lot of our folks as so much riskier that they had no appetite for it. Yeah. The, the second property, because it was already renovated, had a history of uh, rentals for overnight stays and weddings. It's got an event barn with bathrooms and lights. It's yeah. got accommodations for 20 people. It has the right zoning. It's got everything ready to go. It doesn't matter to, uh, it doesn't seem to matter to people that would be lending money for that property hmm. that it costs a little more. Um, because th there's not as much concern with yeah. risk, with the headaches, with permitting, with all the things that can go wrong, um, yeah. especially when they know that other people are coming in, um, yeah. you know, for, for the capital raise. I just hadn't, I hadn't realized the extent of, you know, price is one of many factors. Um, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I, it's just an important lesson. I think anyone could every, and every raise and every project is going to be different, but I think it's, yeah. Louis, so that price isn't the only factor is really important. And, and uh -huh. then the other thing I think you guys learned well was the, um, I didn't even learn well that you, you saw play out was how do you play with, you know, ec equity versus a profit dividend or distribution or, or a dividend or, um, or, or debt and what's the right type of capital for the project. Now this is going to be a for-profit business, highly profitable. Uh, awesome. And so that would lend to, Hey, I want, I want ownership. I want equity. But at the end of the day, if you're just going to be reinvesting profits into new properties and scaling this thing from a ministry standpoint, and if you're going to be, um, you're not going to exit or sell all these properties one day. Like a theory, that's not part, part of the plan, or at least in the next three to seven years that a traditional angel or VC might want a, a big payout. Right. Like that's not part of the reality here. And, and I don't think that in the investor community has really wrapped their head completely around yet. Like that being a thing, like, well, right. that's weird. That doesn't make sense. You know, like right. every business has an egg, egg, every business wants all the profits. Every business wants to exit someday, you know, and that's not always the case. And so I think in the first round, you were going after a lot of folks and a lot of investors that might've been more traditionally focused on the equity piece and maybe also not articulating why that wasn't on the table. And so one of the shifts that I think you made that was really impactful was shifting to say, okay, I'm going to pre-qualify my investors to say, Hey, th this is a debt offering. And that's what it is. It's, it's not an option. Like that's, it's not a conversation like it's a debt offering. This is what we're going to raise. This is how we're going to raise it. Um, and we want you to be a partner. And also then kind of properly setting the stage before that's even presented of why, right. you know, right. and walking them through because the reality is maybe yes. 1% of the wealth in the world and investor money really understands this new social enterprise impact investing space. And so you almost have to pre-educate a lot of investors and they say, Oh, I get it. That makes sense. Yeah. We'll just do it yeah. this way. I love the impact totally. and kind of go. So I guess I I'm sharing all that as like someone who sees this every day, talk to it from your perspective. Like what was it like, or what were the lessons learned kind of as you were in that? And any, maybe even like, how were the conversations different the second time around with some folks where it like it clicked right away and you're like, Oh, well that was a lot easier than it was the first time or something. Yeah. So I, I think one of the, so one of the pieces when, when you're trying to raise money, I think there, you know, for me, one, one of the, um, one of the pitfalls is being willing is, is not having clarity on, on the, the, the type uh, or the structure that you want up front. but having in the back of your mind, I'm a little concerned that it could, it could start to become a problem. 
And so initially I was having a number of conversations mm -hmm. with people, both on the debt and the equity side, but with a concern in the back of my head, and this was kind of what was happening. If we had equity where you have, you know, people that own a part of the project. Yeah. And in year, and in year one, they say, Hey, we did pretty well. We gave away 75 free nights to pastors. That was great. But as a, as one of the owners in the property, I'd love to double my investors. We can still do great for pastors, but what if we gave them half as many nights? And so next year I have twice as good a, a return. And, and from, a, from an investment point of view, that's, that's an understandable ask. Mm. But in an effort to protect the mission, I had to make the determination that the, um, the mission was, was so important that um, we, we couldn't afford to have that tension uh, that I didn't want to have yeah. the intention, that, that tension. So instead of, instead of being unequal, unequally yoked, not saying yeah. people are not yeah. believers, but instead of having one side pulling away from the free nights, yep. we said, we're going to, we're going to provide instead a very high uh, interest um, on, on your, uh, on the capital. And so you're going to know exactly from the front, mm. um, from the beginning, what, you know, what the payment is. Yeah. The other question is on the, on the equity side, to your point, people would say, well, what's, what's the exit? What can we expect? And I think in the beginning, uh, I was thinking to myself, well, we don't want an exit because an exit would mean the sale of the property. And we'd be taking, you know, we'd be taking a, a, a property away where pastors receive rest. Right. I mean, our hope right. is that this property, we never exit. We don't want to totally. exit. Yeah. We want to, we want pastors to rest. And if we sell it, they don't have a place to go. Yeah. 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 And, and I think that's the tension that every founder raising capital has like, okay, if I'm bringing on investors and they have ownership, like what role do they play in the organization? You know, and there's obviously preferred stock and voting shares and non-voting shares and all the different ways you can kind of like keep investors at an arm's length that you also want to partner with them at the same time because they don't always want to be at an arm's length. And I think there's a relationship there and every project's different. Um, but I think again, as it relates to impact investing, sometimes the capital coming in is new to this space. And so I think it's almost like a little bit like the wild west. It, most of the people getting involved don't have 10 projects of experience to say, oh man, that one time that we jeopardized the impact for a faster return, it blew up in our fit. You know, there's not that there. So I think as a founder, you got to work with the investors to kind of mitigate some of that risk right? while still partnering well, because it is a partnership and, and it's a mm -hmm. partnership with the investors. And so I think you guys just did that well. And it was cool to see that shift happen. Um, and I've seen projects shift from debt to where they're thinking, hey, debt, debt, debt is what we want to do. And it's like, really equity has to be the play here because something's different. And so it's not a black and white one or the other. Um, it's thinking about, again, where the organization is at, what they're doing. And I thought it was really cool. So, you know, we got to wrap up here. Um, yeah. What, what, uh, what's kind of the trajectory from here on out? You know, it's, uh, you know, we try to keep the podcast pretty timeless, meaning people can watch, listen to an episode at any point, but it's uh, March, 2022 right now. And uh, what's the trajectory to launch? And if people want to follow along, like what should they be expecting in the next, you know, three to nine months? Great. So March, 2022, Lord willing, we'll close in the next few months. We're in study period right now. So we're checking the well and septic and doing inspections and <laughs> uh, all the necessary parts of our due diligence, we should close on the property, Lord willing, and um, begin opening it up for overnight stays and weddings and pastors and, um, you know, be in operation and begin, um, you know, the, you know, the, the development of the property and, and getting it, awesome. uh, getting it fully, uh, fully ready. And we're just prayerful getting our team all already and the branding and the logo and the website and all the pieces yep. uh, necessary yep. during this time as well. Super cool. What, when would you expect the first paying guests to be on property? And when are you hoping to have the first like pastors cohort on property? So it'll be pretty soon. I mean, the, the, one of the reasons we love high tour is that it's ready to go. I mean, mm, so yeah. within, within about two weeks of closing, we should have our first guest, our first paying awesome. guest staying wow. on property. Yeah. That, that's cool. soon. And, and first pastors cohort right around that time as well. Very cool. Very cool. And if people want to follow along, how do they follow along? They can follow along at, we haven't purchased the website yet, but we hope to, uh, from the current okay. sellers, it will be high tour.com. H E I G H T O R R.com. 
Cool. Yeah. And we'll try to include that or include your contact info in the show notes for a while until that's there. So people can sign up for your newsletters and all that kind of stuff and get involved, but yeah, man, right. it, it's awesome. I love to see the project. It's been tons of fun to work with you guys and it's going to be a cool year watching all this impact happen for sure. Thanks. Thanks for all your help, Ryan. Thank you Yeah, man, for having totally. me on the show. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. We are so thankful you guys are here and listening. As always, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast listening apps. Uh, We would love to keep you guys up to date on new episodes that are coming out when we're launching new episodes and we're launching new seasons uh, and everything in between. So uh, when we're in season, episodes are dropping every single Wednesday. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure you're up to date. Also, uh, if you're loving what we're doing, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, where we're constantly posting about our projects, what they're doing, uh, what kinds of things we're working on. We'll recycle some uh, podcasts, uh, things about our partners, all sorts of fun stuff that you want to see. So hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff and check out what we're doing there. And yeah, we're stoked that you guys are listening. We hope this has been really fruitful and we will catch you guys next week. And lastly, uh, as you guys all know, we always talk about all sorts of things with impact investing, uh, investment opportunities, entity structure modeling, how projects are getting capital. And as a disclaimer and a reminder, Feast Over Famine does not provide legal tax accounting or other professional advice. You should consult professional advisors concerning the legal tax or accounting consequences of any activities related to your project or a project you're supporting. Feast Over Famine doesn't consult, advise, or assist with the offer or sale of securities in any capital raising transaction. We don't do that for the direct or indirect promotion or maintenance of a market for any securities. Uh, And Feast Over Famine does not engage in any activities for which an investment advisor's registration or license is required under the U.S. Investment Advisors Act of 1940 or under any other applicable federal or federal or state law or for which a broker's or dealer's registration or license is required under the U.S. Securities Exchange Act of 1934 or under any other applicable federal or state law. So there's your investment disclaimer. Uh, Hopefully that's helpful if you need it. And if you ever have any questions on that side of things, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Take care.